let's set up. In this video, I'm gonna break down what top 1% software engineers actually do. The habits, behaviors, tools that they use to get ahead that you probably haven't heard before. If you're new here, my name is Amon. I'm a software engineer who's worked at a lot of companies like Amazon and Shopify. And if you watch till the end of this video, I'm gonna reveal the secrets of the top 1%. The things they do, but they don't tell you. And the first thing the top 1% of software engineers I've worked with do is they have a reputation of getting things done. This is one of the greatest characteristics of a top 1% software engineer. They do great work and everyone knows how good they are. They have a solid reputation at the company. And because everybody knows how impactful they are, they were assigned the most important projects. They were assigned the most timely work. It almost compounds on itself. Once you become a top 1% software engineer, you start to get trusted with more and more important tasks. And then you deliver those results and you get more important tasks. And pretty soon you get an excellent performance review because you've just outclassed all the other engineers. And because of that, you're promoted at a much faster rate. At every company I've worked at, Amazon, Shopify, John Deere, the top 1% software engineers were known by everyone. Everyone knew who they were. And because everyone knew who they were, they were almost a different class of engineer. This says nothing about how they actually got there initially, but what I'm trying to explain to you is that the benefits of being a top 1% software engineer compound over time. You just reap those riches because of the reputation you carry. Now, as soon as you join a new company, you're a blank slate. You have an opportunity to go down two paths. You can either do very important work at a very rapid pace and be on your way to become one of the top 1% software engineers, or you can slack off, you can laze around. You can check your phone during work, you can go to the bathroom every 30 minutes, you can joke around and hang out with your coworkers, and then you become the bottom 99% of software engineers. And in the age of AI, the top 1% will get 99% of the results. Listen, in this economy, one software engineer can do the work of 10 software engineers just a few years ago. And if only one software engineer can do the work of 10, who do you think that software engineer is going to be? The top 1% software engineer, the software engineer that everybody knows is top 1%, or you? Listen, I'm not saying you're a bad software engineer. What I am saying is that it is no longer enough to be mediocre. I know many people who were fired, and not because they were bad engineers, no, but because they were average. Because they simply couldn't compete with the top 1%. So in your mind, you must maintain the goal of attempting to reach the top 1% of software engineers. The second behavior that top 1% software engineers can do is that they adequately prioritize work. As a software engineer, you will have projects, tasks, code review, assignments coming in from all directions. And the better you get, the more things will come your way. So it's not like if you become a better engineer, you'll suddenly have much less work and you'll be able to focus more. No, people will trust you, you'll start to get their reputation, and then people will throw even more and more and more difficult, impactful work at you. And one of the biggest characteristics of a top 1% software engineer is that they know how to balance that work without getting overwhelmed. Listen, you have to realize that you can't do everything, but the top 1% software engineer seems like they can do everything. And the reason they come off that way is because they know how to segment their work correctly to give off the impression of handling 10 different things at once. Now, how do they actually do this? They have the skill of strategically turning down unimportant tasks. So a top 1% software engineer at any given moment has a mental visualization of the most important five to 10 things they have to work on. And even that is in order. So let's say some unimportant meeting comes their way, some unimportant bit of code review that can be tackled a few weeks from now, they immediately shut it down. They know how to say no. And because they say no to unimportant things, people respect them more. People only bring the most important work to the top 1% software engineer. Whereas if you're a bottom 99% software engineer, people will give you the less important stuff because they don't feel like your time is valuable because they feel like you're just sitting over there at your laptop and you're not actually contributing to the company. Now, if you join a new company, you might be scared of saying no. I know that I was when I first joined my full-time role out of college. Things come your way and before you know it, you're saying yes to doing everything. And if you say yes to everything, you can't do anything. At the end of the day, you must maintain your top three priorities and if something comes your way that's not one of those priorities, you have to say no. Ask yourself, does this task help or move forward these top three projects I'm working on? And if not, you have to tell the person no. One of the best ways to say no is, I'd love to help, but, or I'd love to take a look at it, but I'm really overloaded with my current tasks. Can you ask, insert other engineer's name? And if they also don't have any availability, maybe I can help you out. Now, the third behavior of a top 1% software engineer is that they push through blockers and they don't let work sit for too long. A blocker is a term you'll pick up when you start working as a software engineer. And for something to be blocked, it means that a piece of work is stuck and it's waiting on some other thing to happen. And there are actually two kinds of blockers, which is something that most people don't realize. There are external blockers and internal blockers. External blockers are true blockers. These are where you're waiting on someone else to complete some task. And in that case, it's much more difficult to actually push through it. But an internal blocker is much more common. And an internal blocker is where you just don't know what to do next. And when you start working as a software engineer, 
you'll get faced with dozens of internal blockers at your new role. And this is because you're not relying on the work of other people. You're an entry-level software engineer. The vast majority of what you're doing doesn't rely on someone else. And at the same time, your experience is at an all-time low. So when problems come up, bugs in your code arise, you're not going to know what to do. Now when you get promoted, you become a senior software engineer, maybe even a tech lead, your blockers will start to become external at that point because you're managing many people. So your work depends on the work of 5 to 10 other engineers. And at that point, you might have to wait for someone else to get something done. Listen, when I first started at my company, I would experience an internal blocker. I wouldn't know what to do. But in my mind, I would treat it like it was an external blocker. I would reach a difficult part of the code, a bug that I didn't know how to immediately solve. And instead of grinding through it, spending a few hours actually trying to fix it, I'd wait a bit, walk around, maybe check my email or phone. And this was a huge mistake. Because this is how you should treat an external blocker, not an internal. If you're externally blocked, if you're waiting on someone else to give you something, sure, at that point, get through some emails, maybe do some other low-value work. But an internal blocker requires you to unblock it. This is something you'll have to learn as an engineer. It requires persistence to break through those internal blockers. The top 1% of software engineers know when they're actually blocked, and it's less than you think. And when a top 1% software engineer is blocked, they know exactly how to unblock themselves. Now, as a junior developer, the easiest way to unblock yourself is to actually ask a senior developer. Which leads me to my next point, which is that the top 1% of software engineers know when to ask for help. This is probably not what you think. You probably think I'm going to tell you that there are no stupid questions, that anything that comes to your mind, you should turn to the senior engineer and ask them. After all, in school, we're taught by our teachers that there are no dumb questions that you should always raise your hand, and often someone else will have the same question. In the world of software engineering, it's a little bit different. People are willing and happy to help but only to a certain point. The truth is that when someone asks too many questions, something that's not talked about is that you don't want to constantly interrupt people. You don't want to ask trivial questions and you don't want to ask for help if you haven't tried to solve something yourself. In software engineering, there's something called a goodwill balance. And you start with a high goodwill balance. People are ready and willing to help you because, hey, you're new at the company. They expect you to have questions. But every single question you ask starts to drain that goodwill balance. And pretty soon, if you've asked dozens and dozens of questions without actually contributing any good work, that goodwill balance might be near empty. And once that goodwill balance hits zero, people start to get upset at you. Let me tell you, at Amazon, my mentor actually got upset at me because I asked him a very, very basic question, something that he'd answered a few weeks before, and in that moment, my goodwill balance dropped. This is an ugly truth, but it's the way that the world of tech works. We are taught our entire lives that there are no stupid questions, but unfortunately, in reality, people tend to lose their patience. Now, the double-edged sword of being a top 1% software engineer is that people are going to ask you for help all the time. And because of this, you'll actually get bogged down by the requests of others. And let me be clear, the top 1% software engineers did not become top 1% because they asked a million questions. They asked questions when the time was right, and they asked high-impact questions. They asked questions when they've done the work, when they try for hours. And they'll bring you a case of evidence with 10 different things that they've tried that haven't actually worked out. These top 1% software engineers also take detailed, detailed notes. They build out their personal documentation. Every time the top 1% software engineer asks someone else for help, they immediately write down the answer in their personal documentation. And more than just writing down the answer, their personal documentation, their notes, have the question and all these different failed attempts that they tried as well. And because of this, they only ever have to ask someone for help once. Now, if you want all of my Notion templates that I use as a software engineer, you can go to amamanazar.com Notion, and they're all available there for free. You can use these to build up your personal documentation and reach the top 1% of software engineers. Finally, the top 1% of software engineers constantly increase their goodwill balance with others by doling out help. They keep up on code review and they have time to help others, even though they get asked more than anyone else. They become the experts in certain areas of the code base, so they become the ones that people trust. At my current company, I started to notice that the CEO and founder of that company would ask one of the senior software engineers before making almost any decision. Me and the CEO would be talking together about some project, and he would tell me, yeah, we should consult the senior software engineer before making this final decision. In that moment, I realized that the CEO trusted the top 1% software engineer more than he trusted his own intuition, or at least he highly, highly valued that engineer's input. Now, before you become a top 1% software engineer, you're going to have to actually become an engineer. And if you're interested in starting a brand new career in tech, Course Careers is the best place to do it. It'll teach you everything required to land a job in tech from start to finish. It's a great replacement for a computer science degree. Many of the graduates don't actually have a computer science degree, but they're out competing people with a degree. They're also industry professionals on the platform, and they provide advice to you. And there are employers who will hire directly from Course Careers. Course Careers is a free introduction course. I would recommend clicking the link in the description to get started with that free course and learning how you can start your career in software engineering without any kind of degree. The fifth habit of a top 1% software engineer is that they over-communicate with the team. 
a top 1% software engineer is in constant communication with their manager. There is never a time where the manager has no clue what they're working on. There's two sides to this. A top 1% software engineer knows exactly what the expectations are because they've clearly asked their manager, what are we doing here? And even further, they've broken down the actionable steps to achieve that goal. And on the other side, the manager knows exactly what part of the process the top 1% software engineer is in. So even if they don't hit their goals, the manager understands why they didn't hit their goals. And when a deadline is missed or hit, the top 1% software engineer and the manager work together to adjust for next time. They're both adapting and learning from each other. Now, when I was working at Amazon, I had this major issue. Because of my lack of experience, I just didn't communicate well with my teammates or my manager. And there were almost weeks at a time where my manager just wasn't sure what I was working on. And I was doing good work, but she just didn't know what I was doing. And this resulted in somewhat of a mediocre performance review halfway through my internship. So in the second half of my internship, I decided to over communicate. And this meant I set up a Slack channel with my manager, my product manager, and my mentor. And every day I would send a status update in there as to exactly what I was doing, what blockers I was experiencing and what progress I was making. Every single party involved with my work knew exactly where I was at any given moment. And they specifically told me later on that my communication skills had gotten far, far better and it was leading to way more results. Let me be frank, there should never be a period of time where the other engineers have no idea what you're doing. Now, this is more of a problem in some companies than others. Some companies have a very distributed culture. This means that the engineers don't really communicate with each other that well. And in that context, you're more at a risk of under-communicating. Whereas in a company like Shopify, which has more of an open culture, it's less of an issue. And finally, this is more of a problem when you're an intern rather than a full-time engineer. Many companies will throw a separate project at you when you're an intern. So it's up to you to constantly talk to your manager and make sure that they're keyed in with what you're doing. Next behavior of a top 1% software engineer is that they're constantly learning and voicing their opinions. One thing you'll realize once you enter the world of software engineering is that your learning has just begun. Your real education starts once you leave school and enter the world of work, which is something that people just don't understand. Which I understand. Honestly, I think in other fields, other industries where things move much slower, the base principles have not changed in 20 or 30 years, you can get away with not learning. In those industries, everything you learn in college is enough to be a successful worker. But in software engineering, this is not the case. I've touched on AI several times, but every single week it seems like a new AI tool is coming out. And if you're not willing to go ahead and actually learn how to leverage those, you will fall behind. A top 1% software engineer stays top 1% because they're always willing to learn and adapt and change. New languages, frameworks, updates to tools are always constantly being thrown at you. In the world of software, your education is never complete. Listen, one great way to separate yourself as a top 1% software engineer is to become the resident AI expert and apply the tools of AI to your actual company. Now these top 1% software engineers, they're not forcing themselves to be interested in learning new things. They just do it naturally. One of the top 1% software engineers in my company, I would just catch him reading new papers about new languages that were created. He would just go through the documentation for fun because he was curious about something. Not because he necessarily had to find a specific answer, but because he was genuinely interested. And this interest compounds over time. An engineer who's genuinely interested in learning about new languages, frameworks, technologies that are coming out, ends up learning a little bit every day, but over 300 days, that engineer is far ahead of the other engineers and thus becomes a top 1% engineer. These top 1% software engineers also have strong opinions and they're willing to voice them. When someone is not a top software engineer, they may have some opinions, but they know internally that they're not at the top of the game, so they feel uncomfortable voicing their opinions about specific languages or technologies. Hell, my entire company switched from Linux to Mac based off of the input of one top 1% software engineer. The CEO decided to switch a bunch of people onto Mac, because the top 1% engineer told them to. The leadership of your company will trust the top 1% software engineers because they always take a stand. They don't just sit on the side, listen to the superiors, and have no opinion. No, the two top 1% software engineers in my company, both of them have the knack of voicing their opinions loudly. What they have is they have strong opinions weakly held. So they're willing to throw their opinion out there, they're willing to argue with the management, but as soon as they change their mind, they immediately back off. These opinions are not ideologically based, they're based in facts and logic. Some people would say the way you survive in a company is you sit on the side, you don't argue with anybody, you don't present your opinion forward. But that's how you stay a bottom 99% software engineer. The top 1%, they voice their opinions and they voice their opinions clearly and frequently. If you're interested in landing a job in tech, go to amonmanazar.com slash resume. You can get my resume template, the template that got me into Amazon, Shopify, and HP. Thank you guys for watching, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the top 1%.